Hi, I am Rick Phillips. Good evening to everyone who is connected and welcome to Arthritis and Mental Health, the Inflammation Connection webinar. Uh, I have had rheumatoid arthritis for 23 years and I have been also living with ankylosing spondylitis for about five years. Uh, along my journey, uh, before, during, and uh, now, I've also been treated for uh, chronic depression. We all know that ar having arthritis takes a terrible toll. And I don't think that there's anything worse than the mind-body uh, experience. As we have, uh, as we know, um, anxiety and uh, depression just kind of follow inflammation. That's why tonight I am so excited to, uh, to talk about uh, the webinar. Our guest tonight will share tips and guidance to help you heal or stave off arthritis-related mental health impacts. The advice shared will be relevant whether you're dealing with a mental health diagnosis like depression, such as I am, or struggling with the struggles of living with chronic illness. There really is no... Uh, nobody who has a chronic illness who can't uh, who, who can't benefit from listening in. And I'm so glad that each of you have decided to tune in. We have muted all attendees for this event, but you can direct any questions you may have throughout the presentation to the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. We'll start with presentations and reserve some time to answer questions at the end of our discussion. After tonight's session, you will receive an email asking about your experience. These surveys help the foundation better plan for future events, so please take time to fill them out. Remember, uh, if you share uh, uh, confidential items, please remember not to share confidential items. Um, a recording is being made, and uh, it will be included uh, with Arthritis Foundation materials. So let's start off with our speaker introduction. Dr. Haroon is Associate Director of the Emory Behavioral Immunology Program. His research focuses on understanding of the neural basis of behavioral changes in medically healthy and medically ill patients, including patients with cancer. More specifically, he's interested in how the immune system affects depression and fatigue. He is certified in adult psychiatry and brain injury medicine by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. In 2016, he was appointed to the editorial board of the Brain Behavioral and Immunity Project. He has published over 40 papers. Dr. Uh, Menard is director of Menard Neuro Lab Open in the Neuroponics Center at the Servo Brain Research Center. Her research focuses on impacts of stress, on resilience, and the development of mood disorders. In her previous academic positions, she investigated the neurobiology of learning and memory, diet-induced brain plasticity, aging, and Alzheimer's disease. She has a broad background in neuroscience, psychiatric disorders, behavioral studies with specific expertise in brain plasticity, stress response, neurovascular health, and immunology. Thanks to Dr. Arun and Menard for joining us tonight. We'll start by we'll start the discussion by handing it off to Dr. Haroon. Dr. Haroon, please take it away. So um I'm going to begin with, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Rick for uh, the generous introduction, and I wanted to thank Arthritis Foundation. So I just wanted to begin with uh, a general broad overview. I'm a clinical, uh, I'm, a, I'm a clinician and a researcher, and I study, I see patients on a daily basis. So depression and anxiety seems to be almost twice as common among subjects with arthritis. Now, Depression is generally believed to be about uh, impacting about one out of five people and anxiety impacts about one out of six, although these two tend to coexist quite often. Now, so arthritis patients, and as you will see in the next slide, appear to have appear to be at a higher risk 
of experiencing mental health problems uh, for, due to a variety of reasons. And there is this is something that you know the field is grappling with because when psychiatrists these psychiatrists diagnose depression or what we call as major depression, that is in the absence of other medical problems. But you know, typically in rheumatoid arthritis or in autoimmune disorders, there is another major issue. There is an immune disorder that causes this. But if you look at the modern literature, both these the primary depression and immune disorders are coming together. Dr. Menard will expand upon this. So I'm going to just, just walk to the next slide. So this slide kind of, I wanted to begin by summarizing the studies. And this is a meta-analysis, which basically means they're kind of basically, they're just studying all, all the studies that have been published up to that date. It's uh, the, the, this line represents what we call as the proportional hazards ratio. Basically one is you're, as risk, you're at as much risk as a general population with, you know, you, you don't have any additional risk compared to the general population. Two is a very high risk and 0.5 is lower risk. And so this central line represents no risk at all. This broken line, as you can see, this dotted line appears to represent the average risk of depression um, experienced by subjects with, I mean, folks with arthritis. Now this includes uh, several of these arthritis, as you can see, this is rheumatoid arthritis, as you can see, osteoarthritis, again, it's kind of high, um, psoriatic arthritis. So this is arthritis due to many different conditions, uh, you know, autoimmune, degenerative, many causes, including even vascular causes. Now, systemic lupus erythematosus, as you can see, has a very high levels of depression, but that's a very well-known phenomenon due to vascular. That's because of uh, SLE is a vascular disease, and so there is a higher incidence of depression in that uh, disorder. I just don't want to, I'm sorry about the complicated slide, but basically I'm just going to walk you through this. Um, so the, the first question that comes to our mind is, are, how does depression impact people? How, how does depression impact the treatments for arthritis? And one of the ways is, as you can see, this represents this HAQ is a scale that measures the disability in rheumatoid arthritis. And this DAS3 is actually the kind of thing that rheumatologists use to measure the overall severity of rheumatoid arthritis. This little triangle is de high, severe depression or high depressions. The little rectangle in the middle is moderate depression. And this diamond at the very end represents low levels of depression. And as you can see, people with the high levels of depression tend to have a higher level of rheumato uh, higher level of rheumat rheumatological rheumatoid arthritis symptoms and the associated disability despite treatment. These are all treated patients, as you can see. So after 24 months of treatment, these patients still continue to remain high, meaning they show more symptoms and more disability from these arthritic, from their arthritic disorders. Now, I'm going to give you the next two slides are going to focus on what would be the common causes. And some of them are common sense, but I just wanted to list them anyway. Um, as uh, Rick rightly mentioned, pain, stiffness, and mobility limitations is one of the a major cause of frustration, helpless, and anxiety in, in, in patients with arthritis. And the other thing is, again, this is a, something that I will talk about in more detail in the subsequent slide, but chronic pain drives increased depression and anxiety-related change, uh, related changes in brain, brain circuitry and brain chemistry. And I will talk about this in a little bit in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the next couple of slides. And social isolation, and this is a very big thing. It's just become very big since the onset of COVID. I don't know, many of you have read that people who are more lonely and isolated because of COVID experienced an increase in the mortality and morbidity from various disorders. So expanding upon extending from what I told you the other day, this is a problem with the younger individuals, but it can be an older age problem as well. I have, I treat a lot of people who have uh, multiple, several types of, I have a young woman who's, who has an ankylosing spondylitis. I have uh, several young individuals with psoriatic and other rheumatoid and SLE. 
So the problem is these people tend to face discrimination because they are living in a college town, a college atmosphere. They're living in their dorms and their friends are partying and they can join them. And so it's a very, it's a, it's a, it, it kind of causes more dis, depression and sadness in these people. Um, the stress, I'm going to leave this to Dr. Menard, but stress can ex exacerbate almost all medical disorders, including mental health problems and arthritis. Um, and inflammation is a, is a chronic problem in any type of arthritis, and that's what we're going to you know, talk a little bit more in detail. So here, again, please ignore this in the middle. This is a lot of science -y thing. I'll walk you through this. I'm sorry about it. This, this slide is quite cluttered, but I will tell you what I intend to tell you. The main issue here is that whether, I mean, so there are two, two gateways to arthritis. One is where in rheumatoid disease or in ankylosing spondylitis, where the body's inflammatory mechanism starts attacking your, your joints. Okay, that's one, one pathway. The other is where the giant disease, like in osteoarthritis, your joints get, get more and more degenerative and it sets up this loss of joint tissue and that triggers an inflammation. Either way, you're dealing with more inflammation and some of these chemicals, namely IL-6, TNF-alpha, that I think Dr. Menard will be talking in more detail about, tend to be released by these inflammatory processes. And once they're released, they impact the liver and lead to an increase. They, they act on the liver and increases this chemical called CRP, which I'm sure many of you are aware of because most doctors check them on a routinely on a basis along with the erythrocyte sedimentation rates. So this CRP increases uh, is simply an index of inflammation. But nevertheless, uh, what I want you to is completely skip the middle. But what I want you to see is this inflammation in turn leads to progression of, of your heart and your vascular disease it leads to bone destruction uh, and bone loss and osteoporosis in some people, a giant disease such as osteoarthritis in some others, or what we call as degenerative arthritis, even vascular diseases like clots in your blood, uh, in, your, in your arteries and veins leading to deep venous thrombosis or a cerebral stroke. So this is one of the main problems. So this persistent inflammation is leading to a whole bunch of things. Now, what about the brain? Now, Again, I'm sorry about the complicated picture, but I will walk you through this. Basically, uh, when there is high levels of inflammation, there is this chemical, uh, there are these chemicals called cytokines that are being released into the bloodstream. Now your inflammation can, can come from stress, can come from obesity, as I will show you later, and can come from rheumatoid diseases, arthritis, but nevertheless, they all end up releasing these chemicals called cytokines. And they do enter into the brain. Dr. Menard has done some groundbreaking research on that. I will leave her to present that. But once they get into the brain, they end up stimulating the brain immune system. And there are several brain immune cells. I don't want to get into the details and get lost and overwhelm the audience. But nevertheless, these are all brain immune cells that are getting activated. And when this happens, the, uh, the neurons start making uh, start demonstrating changes, meaning these immune cells cause some changes in the chemical function of these neurons. Now, let me explain this. The neurons don't directly connect to each other, but they connect to each other through these chemical bridges. And these chemical bridges are called the neurotransmitters. There are several of these neurotransmitters that we all know. There is a neurotransmitter called the serotonin. Some of them are called, one of them is called dopamine. One of them is called the norepinephrine, and the other one is called the glutamate. All of these neurotransmitters are altered by immune system, um, by these immune molecules. Once they alter this, what happens is the alterations in these, in these immune neurotransmitters are mainly taking place in this system that we call as emotional and pain perception system. These are all, these are all the brain regions that are involved in perceiving your emotional or your physiological pain. So in some ways, if you start looking at bodily pain and emotional, emotional uh, symptoms such as anxiety and depression as something equivalent to pain, they lead to this, they are kind of processed by this comprehensive system. And this neural circuitry is disrupted, leading to anxiety, depression. And there's, other, there's another thing called the anhedonia where your emotions are blunted. You don't feel like, you don't feel like you're interested in anything. You just feel blah. And so anyway, now 
let's kind of take a little bit of a dive into the clinical aspects of this. What happens? What is the overlap between inflammation, pain, and depression? Basically, when there is a chronic inflammation in any part of the body, the immune cells go to that region and release these substances that actually bind to the pain, that directly bind to these pain receptors. These are usually naked nerve endings or other specialized pain receptors that are located in your skin or in, in, your, in your muscles, et cetera. When these receptors are stimulated, they carry the messages locally within the spinal cord and in the brain, resulting in what is known as both the sensory experience of the pain and the perceptual or the cognitive experience of the pain, which includes an emotional component. Thus, there is a perception, the pain exists both at the physiological or the physical level and at the psychological level, which is the emotional level. And once the substances, these substances that I was talking to you, they trigger the release of internal neurochemicals that can accentuate or modify the pain. And you know, some of you already know, you all know things like endorphins that can regulate the amount of pain that you feel. And many of your opiate medications actually mimic these endorphins. So, uh, so these can affect, the, the interesting thing is several of these pain measures and pain signals modify the neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and glutamate, in emotion regulating neurons, which are actually both the emotions and the pain are regulated by very similar systems. I think I showed you that in my previous slide. So they cause neurochemical changes in these brain circuits that regulate both emotion and pain at the same time. And glutamate is one of the most common because 60% of brain's neurotransmission comes through this glutamate. And your pain, all the pain neurons also use this uh, glutamate as a as a neurotransmitter. So several of the treatments kind of focus on blocking this glutamate one way or the other. And I'll explain that in a, in a future slide. So now, how to treat? What is the treatment? I mean, how does the treatment of inflammation and depression overlap or how do they work? So the most interesting thing is, first of all, pain, uh, let me tell you. So let me start with this. Antidepressants, they work by targeting this serotonin dopamine. I think I've told you that in a previous slide. But interestingly, the antidepressants also help in, in managing pain symptoms, meaning some of these medications such as Cymbalta and Yelavil are commonly prescribed by the rheumatologist for pain, pain control, rheumatologists, neurologists, they prescribe that for pain symptoms as well. Contrarily, anti-inflammatory medications such as this non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, such as say Celebrex, Celicoxib, and uh, most recently we did a pioneering study on infliximab, which is a, one of the medications that given for a different inflammatory bowel disease and inflammatory arthritis, actually improved mood among patients with the depression who had high levels of peripheral inflammation. So we, we hypothesized that these medications somehow worked by reducing the brain inflammation. Um, uh, so, so anyway, uh, uh, so the anti-inflammatory medications improve depression and the pain, uh, anti-depressant medications help pain. So interestingly, the supplements also seem to help both of them. Although there is a lot of inst instability in their findings. I'm not entirely sure whether omega-3 fatty acids improve depression per se, although there is some data. Uh, it's still very shaky uh, at this point. And there is also a trend to prescribe omega-3 fatty acids at high levels for mood disorders in addition to its high levels of prescription or, or at least the, the over-the-counter sales pitch for this, uh, which I would recommend everybody to talk with their rheumatologist or their primary care before they increase engage in this high-dose high intake because in psychiatry, high dose omega-3 fatty acids have caused some side effects that were concerning. Um, curcumin is a natural food supplement that is pr present in the in turmeric and, and in, in, in several such agents that is used in the cuisines of many countries. The problem is it may it is known to have anti-inflammatory effects, but the amount present in food is very low. So you end up needing a high level of medications for, you, you end up needing a high level of doses to have anti-inflammatory effects. Finally, antidepressants, I think I've told you this. 
Now, the latest, some of the more newer approaches involve targeting glutamate. I think I told you that because glutamate is the more the newer frontier in the treatment of depression and in pain. And as you can see, there is this chemical called GABA, which is anti-glutamate, meaning it is drawn, it is derived from glutamate, but it blocks the effects of glutamate. And I told you that glutamate increases the pain perception or at least communicates the pain perception to the brain. So you could potentially block it with GABA. And so some of these medications such as Neurontin and Lyrica are believed to work through that angle, meaning they block, they increase GABA and block glutamate. Other medications such as ketamine directly block glutamate, but you know, ketamine is also useful for the treatment of depression and pain. In fact, ketamine was originally uh, uh, discovered for treatment of pain. It's an anal it is an anesthetic agent. And uh, finally, there's also some evidence that TMS will work in this uh, context. Um, exercise and anti-inflammatory diet, I'm going to talk about that, yoga, meditation, all these, all these are considered to be anti-inflammatory things. But nevertheless, the ultimate treatment is going to be a combination of approaches. Here, I'm just, this is the last, second last slide that I have. Basically, what, it's going, what it is telling us is that, that the, there are several other causes. So meta-inflammation is now the term that uh, uh, most endocrinologists and other metabolism researchers tend to ascribe to inflammation that, that comes out of excess, um, excess uh, energy in consumption of different kinds, meaning you know, high levels of food intake, high caloric food, high levels of um, reduced physical activity, etc. So controlling the diet would be a very important thing. Reducing the high calorie diet, caloric restriction has been proven to reduce inflammation. Um, similarly, some of the increase in what is known as the Mediterranean diet, where which has a lot of omega-3 fatty acids may be helpful in this context. For instance, olive oil is also considered to be anti-inflammatory in many ways. Uh, increased physical activity is a major problem. And I think it's a bigger problem for people with arthritis, primarily because they have a lot of pain issues. So this becomes a major issue in pain-prone pain disorders, pain uh, arthritic problems, in which case we heavily recommend the you know, dietary manipulations, those kind of things. Um, uh, the other other uh, other measures that I mentioned in the previous slide, such as yoga, meditation, can also reduce this kind of inflammation. The other avoidable causes will be things like smoking, alcohol consumption, which are well known to increase inflammation, and finally, good treatment of chronic medical diseases and using CBT or cognitive behavior therapy to control stress, about which Dr. Menard will talk about. And so this is my final slide. Basically, uh, basically, uh, chronic inflammation can cause changes in the brain, meaning along with the pain, it also causes changes in the brain. And so it kind of reshapes, reshapes your brain architecture in such a way that you end up feeling depressed. And the ideal approach to this is to combination of treatments, if needed medications, um, we also recommend a treatment called behavioral activation, where you engage in more rewarding activities. Um, uh, and again, this needs to be very carefully tailored in people with arthritis because there is a pain issue as well, because so you may not be able to go out and run one mile a day. So, you know, the, there are, there are, it has to be tailored to your, uh, everybody's uh, ability, exercise, healthy diet, such as Mediterranean diet, reduction in calories, prioritizing rest and sleep. Uh, and th those are important things. And if there's a sleep problem, then antidepressants can help there as well improving social interaction and support with the family. And finally, cognitive behavior therapy, which kind of, there are several types of th therapy. One of them, I address pain. So there could be a CBT for pain. There's a CBT for depression, um, but there are therapists who do both together sometimes. So I would, I would be, I would uh, yield to my colleague now and she will take this from here onwards.
Thank you so much, Dr. Arun. So um, I'm glad to be here. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to apologize first for my voice. I've been sick the last couple of days. And in fact, I wasn't sure I would be able to talk at all. So the fact I'm here is already a win. So um, I'm going to ask start my, my presentation by ask, asking you a simple question, which is, are you stressed? And I give you choices. So are you stressed a lot, just enough, a little bit, or not at all? So if you ask a bunch of Canadian, let me see if it works. Yes. So this is their answer. I'm sorry, it's in French and it's small, so I make it a little, a little bit bigger. So it, there's about 24, 25% of people will say they are stressed a lot. About 50% of people will say, say they are stressed enough or a little bit. And you have about 25% who will say they are stressed not at all, or we also call them liar. And so when you ask people what stress them, most people will answer work or if your stu student is going to be your studies. So it's about two thirds. Other cause of stress can be finance, lack of time, family issues or personal issues. And when we think about work, well, we work a lot. We work nine to five, Monday to Friday. And so before we move on, I want to make the difference between an acute and a chronic stress. So on the left, you have a couple of examples. Let me put my pointer. So you have a couple of examples of acute stress. And what's common between them is you have a form of control over it and it's defined in time. So, for example, if you're stuck in traffic, maybe your heart will be pumping, your hand will become sweaty. But then when you're going to get to your appointment or you're going to get to work, all of this physiological response will resolve. Same if you give a talk or a presentation, you're going to probably know how many people will be in the room, how long you're going to have. So you have a form of control over the stress. And finally, if you hear a noise at night during camping, well, hopefully it's not a bear, it's probably a raccoon. But if it's still there in the morning, you're going to be in trouble and it's going to be more than stress. On the right, you have example of chronic stress. So for example, work, you can be overload. If you are like losing someone, you're gonna live strong emotion like grief. If you are stressed socially, if there's some bullying going on or uh, social intimidation, it's another form of stress. You don't know when it will occur and you don't know how long it's gonna last for. Finally, chronic pain can also be considered a form of chronic stress because it's gonna be again on a long period and you don't much have control sometimes over it. So the, the science between stress has been evolving in the last decades or century, I should say. So first, we talk a lot about resilience. So generally, we define resilience as the capacity to resist or recover quickly from stressful events of what we call adversity. So back in the day, in the 80s, people were thinking that it was more a psychological approach. So if you will see the glass half full versus half empty, you might be more optimistic, you will be more protected. But then now we know there's also a lot of biology behind these differences between becoming stress susceptible or resilient to the stress. There's been a lot of interest in hormones, uh, how the neurons are functioning, not only their molecular adaptation, but also how they are like, connected together. And now I'm going to move to the new topic, which is inflammation. And we just heard a little bit about it from Dr. Haroun. So my lab has been interested not only in inflammation, but also neurovascular health. Here, I'm going to walk you through why we're, we're interested into it. So first, the prevalence of depression or uh, depressive disorder, MDD, it's about 7% in the US. So here in Canada, we're a bit happier at 6. Europe is 5. But overall, it's 20% of people who will suffer from it through, throughout their lifetime. It's a leading cause of disability. And it's important to know that not everybody responds well to treatment, and in fact, only to 30% of people will not experience another depressive episode. So we think that the drug and the treatment we have, they can work really well in some people, but maybe they're not, they're not helping everybody. So maybe we should think outside of the neuron and the brain and more a whole body approach and, and target other biological mechanisms. And so why we're interested into inflammation and cardiovascular disease and health, it's because when you look at the prevalence of depression, it jumps from 6-7% all the way up to 17, 27% in people with cardiovascular disease. After stroke, it's going to be 50% of people who will develop depressive symptoms and in arthritis. And it's also a much higher uh, prevalence as mentioned by Dr. Arun. And so what we think is going on is you have a common biology behind these conditions and it could be inflammation and vascular dysfunction. So this is what we think is going on. So 
Here on the left, you have a couple of studies published when I was in New York or since I'm here in Quebec City. And what we think is going on is on this little cartoon. So when you are under chronic stress, again, not acute, but chronic stress, so not much control and a long period of time, what's going to happen is you're going to have a release of a peripheral immune cells, so immune cells from the periphery of your body, not your brain. So they're going to come from your bone marrow or from the spleen. They will circulate in the bloodstream. They will be attracted to the brain, where they will release a lot of inflammatory mediators, such as cytokine, again mentioned by Dr. Haroun. And so what we've been very interested here is this barrier, which we call the blood-brain barrier, so the BBB. So it's the frontier that's protecting your brain from what's going on in the blood. And so what we found is that the inflammation that is going on in the blood, it's fragilizing the blood-brain barrier, which eventually will activate the immune system of the brain, the microglia, and will alter the activity of the neurons. And so one thing we're doing is we use animal models to try to understand the biology of depression, but also resilience. And a question I often get is, how do we know a mouse is depressed? So obviously you cannot ask them, but here you have on the left, the constellation of symptoms associated with depression. And we can measure all of those in animal except the last one. And so one thing that's very important is chronic stress is the main risk factor to become depressed in human. So what we do is we subject our animals to a form of chronic stress for example, social stress for only 10 days. And this will be sufficient to create a population of animals with depression-like behavior and a population of animals who are resilient. And then we can study the biology, the inflammation, the immune system, the blood-brain barrier, et cetera. So what I found when I was in New York is pretty, and was mentioned by Dr. Ramon is pretty much summarized here. So what we found is in the animal that are not stressed at all or are resilient to the stress, it's very quiet in the blood. There's not much inflammation going on. If we inject some dye, they, they stay in the blood, so they don't pass the blood-brain barrier. And we think this is important for normal social and stress coping behavior. But on the right, you have what's going on in the animal that develop depressive behavior. So there's going to be a lot of immune cells circulating in their blood. They will release a lot of inflammatory mediators, such as interleukin-6, a, a cytokine, which is pro-inflammatory. So this will fragilize and create a little hole in the blood-brain barrier. And then this inflammation will be able to sneak from the blood into the brain. So this is what we see here in green. So this is an animal on stress versus with the stress these are the little molecule I'm talking about in green. You can see they pass in the, the barrier and they leak into the brain. And we think it's creating the depression-like behavior. And one thing that's important is this barrier that's protecting our brain. It's not leaking everywhere. So in the male, it's been leaking mostly in the nucleus accumbens. So the nucleus accumbens, it's a hub for mood regulation, reward, and stress response. And other brain area are totally normal. Not all of them, but most of them. And so there's two questions question we try to address when I opened my lab five years ago here in Quebec City in Canada. So it's how do the resilient mice maintain that blood brain bar integrity? So we've been testing different strategy. We currently have project going on with some diet, some exercise, etc. And we also are very curious about female for a number of reasons. First, depression is more prevalent in women, almost twice more uh, diagnosis of depression are in women. But what's also important is the symptoms are different. And the woman will report higher level of stress in daily life, the little small stress that we experience uh, day to day. And it's important to know that cardiovascular disease as well as inflammatory condition are associated with stress and higher prevalence of depression, but vice versa. Generally, people with depression will be more prone to develop conditions such as cardiovascular disease and inflammatory uh, disease. And finally, we often think as heart disease as men disease, but stroke with heart disease is the main cause of premature death in women. And so what happens when you stress animals like mice and you collect the brain and, and the immune system and you look at what's going on, it's very different. So here I show you two brain area, the nucleus accumbens I mentioned, that was leaky in the male, and the prefrontal cortex, which is important for self-esteem, social in in interaction, and, and other complex human behavior, as well as rodent. And when you compare the, the change that happened in the brain, and you have the male in blue and the female in pink, it's very different. So you only have about 20, 30% of the gene that change will be the same. And it's the same in human. So we do have access to human brains. So we have a brain bank that have a 
people who unfortunately die by suicide and generously gave their brain to science. And so we can compare what's going on in their brain versus what's going on in the animal brain. And I hope you can appreciate that it's the same in the human brain. So the gene that change in the brain, it's very different if you're a man or a woman who died by suicide and then I had a, a diagnosis of depression. It's only five, 10%. So it's almost like it's two different disease. And then, so this we should be really considered when you choose treatment or when different approach are, are used in the context of depression or condition who have higher rate of depression. So what I mean about the little holes that are created by stress, this is what you can see here. So here you have an animal that was not stressed, an animal that's resilient, and in color you have the vessel. So in red you have the vessel the, that are forming the blood-brain barrier, and in green you have this, these proteins that are closing the gap between the cell of the barrier, and you see that there's little hole here in the animal that were stressed. And in the female, what we observe is it's not happening in the nucleus accumbens, which was happening in the male, but in the prefrontal cortex. So another brain area, which we think it's involved and play a role in the different symptoms that people experiencing depression uh, report. And so this is here, no need to look at the graph, but again, in the female, in the nucleus accumbens, no difference. So it seems to be really sex and region specific. And what I mean about having a leaky vessel and a leaky blood-brain barrier, this is the little cloud you can see here. So what we do is we stress the animals, and before we collect the brain, we inject a dye in the blood. And then if we detect the dye in the brain, then we know the blood-brain bar was leaky. So this is the little cloud you see here in the stressed animals. And it's not like a stroke. It's not the blood-brain bar is not leaky everywhere. It's just the little hot spots here and there that are leaky. But what's important is it's never happening in unstressed animal or the one that are resilient, it's very low. And then the volume of the leakiness, it's much bigger as well in the animal who, who were susceptible to the stress. So what does it mean for all of you who are not mice? Uh, there's three things. So first, we aim to identify biomarker of stress and mood-related disorder, because again, right now in 2023, we don't have any uh, any candidate to diagnose in the blood depression. So we use questionnaire. Um, and so we think that if the blood brain bar is leaking and inflammation come from the blood into the brain, maybe there's something that's leaking from the brain into the blood and we could use as a biomarker. As mentioned by Dr. Arun, maybe we could lower the inflammation and protect the blood-brain barrier, and this would be a way to develop novel antidepressant. And finally, could we detect depression by looking at the blood-brain barrier? So this is a study that has been done in 2020 by a group in Dalhousie in East Canada. So they've been doing that in the context of bipolar disorder. So here you have what it looks like when the blood-brain bar is leaky in human. So people go to a scan and then they are, uh, have a, an injection of a contrasting agent in their, in their arm. And then if you detect the contrasting agent, you're going to have some red signal, as you can see here. So in a controlled person, blood-brain bar is intact no leakiness, but in people with bipolar disorder, there's some leakiness that is observed and it's very heterogeneous. So some people it's gonna be a little bit everywhere. Some people it's gonna be on the one side, but overall, as you can see on the graph here, you have more leakiness and you have one subgroup with a lot of leakiness. And this is the group that has the worst score for depression. So the higher depression, the higher anxiety and the lower global functioning. So this is all new work, but we think it's very exciting and it's making the future much, much brighter in psychiatry. Another thing I've been talking about is biomarker. There's been a lot of interest about inflammation related biomarkers. So here at the bottom, you have a ton of different compounds associated with inflammation. And on the right, you have different psychiatric conditions. So depression, autism, PTSD, suicide, sleep, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. And what I wanted to show you here is there's a lot of differences. And one of the cytokine that always come up, it's interleukin-6. And this is also high in arthritis, especially in the when it's a chron the, chron the condition is chronic and there's a lot of inflammation going on. And one thing that's great, it's, it's an, an interesting tool, but it's high in all the conditions. So it's not that great for diagnosis. So we think that what's going to be important is to find a signature. So maybe not just one cytokines, but a couple of cytokines, which will form a signature. And so we've been trying to help with that. 
Again, using a human sample, we have human brain. Here I wanted to show you what a human brain with leaky blood-brain barrier looks like. So you see here the little holes in the green signal versus the red signal. And so we have also blood sample from people who were diagnosed with depression and again, generously gave sample uh, when they were admitted to the emergency. And we've been trying to identify biomarkers of depression. And so we found one that is associated with leakiness of the barrier of the brain. And so this one is higher in women. But again, it's interesting, it doesn't change in men. So don't worry, we're working really hard on men uh, sample as well to identify a biomarker that could be part of this signature that could be helpful for clinicians to not only do a diagnosis of depression or other psychiatric condition, but also maybe help eventually with the choice of treatment. So have a more personalized medicine, like what has been happening in cancer, for example, in the last uh, decades. So I want to end with a couple of, of points that I think are very important. So why not consider only the brain and think about depression and stress as a whole body response. So this is the progress we've made in the last, uh, I would say, 70 years. So here in dark blue, you have depression and schizophrenia and heart disease. So the treatment we had with different mechanisms, like the different drugs we could use back in the 50s. And you can see we made a lot of progress in heart disease, but in psychiatry, we kind of stick in the, and stuck in the last century. And depression here is probably ketamine that Dr. Arul mentioned. And so that's why we think that by thinking outside of the box, we may come up with new ideas and new way to treat uh, people and help more people. So I want to highlight also the burden of disease. So when you look at the number of years lived with disability and you compare different conditions, well, mental health sadly is first. And when you look on the right side of the year of life lost, you find cardiovascular disease, stroke, as well as blood disease. And what I want to point out is that unfortunately, when you look at the money invested in research, it's very low compared to the importance of these questions. And I'm not saying here that we should remove money for cancer or infection or neurological disorder, but I think we need new dollar, new investment to target these very important questions that are like affecting the life of many, including their families. And I, I also want to say that it's not only research that need more money, but also services, because people will need help, for example, in their community need to have access to this help uh, easily to be, to be able to uh, have a better life. And then I want to end by positive messages because I'm a positive person. First, stress is not always bad. So I know I've been saying for the last 15 minutes that you need to be careful about stress, but you need to know that stress is very important for survival. So here you have a number of quotes from some of my colleagues across the world who work on stress and are experts in stress field. So stress is very important again, acute, not chronic, because you need to develop coping strategies. So what are you going to do if you face a lion and you've never faced any stress before? You, your body needs to be prepared to face stress. And in fact, in some organisms, being exposed to short period of stress can make them live longer. So this is an interesting take that stress is not always bad, but it's the level and the duration of the stress that you have to be careful. Finally, stress is associated with memory. So nobody remember the boring roller coaster. So you're gonna remember the roller coaster that make your heart pump and you scream. And this is what you will remember. Same when you travel, sometimes you will push yourself, you will challenge yourself. And this is the story you're gonna tell your friend you, when you will come back. So it's very important to develop uh, resilience, but as well as good memories and, and souvenirs. I also wanted to give you a resource. So I have this colleague, Dr. Sonia Lupien, who's at the University of Montreal, also in Canada. She, she wrote this book. I'm sorry, I think it's on in French for the love of stress, par amour de stress. Um, and she, but one thing that's important is she has a website here at the bottom, humanstress.ca. So she has a lot of students in psychology and medical school who goes in her lab and study stress. And they all write articles about stress in any condition you can think of. So stress in children, stress in, in the elderly, stress at work, uh, st what can you can do about it? Is there any way that you can be held by physical exercise? So there's a ton of uh, really interesting article on that website. So humanstress.ca, they have what they call a mammoth magazine. So uh, because they see stress as, as our ancestor, like seeing a big mammoth and you need to, to cope with it or to figure a way to overcome it. So I really invite you to go see that website. 
And then uh, finally, there's a question I often get when I give talk either to the general public or in the media. And so it's what is your recipe for resilience? So how to be more resilient? So here you have my own recipe for resilience. So I spend a lot of time with my family. I spend a lot of time with my friends. Since I've been back here in Quebec, I've been fly fishing. Uh, we can catch salmon maybe an hour away from here. It's important to take vacation. So we have six months of snow in Quebec City. So you need to find something to do. So I do some cross country skiing. Uh, I love to go camping. I didn't have a picture of myself playing tennis, but I put my favorite player who sadly retired last year. I played video games. So I just bought a brand new Zelda yesterday. So I'm very excited to play it. Uh, of course, I have my cats, uh, Glia and Eddie. So Glia, it's a, it's a nerd name because it's a type of cell in the brain. Uh, and Eddie, it's because of uh, we like heavy metal, my boyfriend and I. So there's nothing like going to a concert when you're very stressed and you had bad news and you just go and you release the steam. So this is what we like to do and it's it's very important for our mental health. Um, and finally, here in Quebec, we have poutine. So this is our comfort food. So it's a mix of French fries, gravy and cheese curd. It's amazing for mental health, but not that great for vascular health. So <laughs> to be careful about that. And with that, I want to thank my lab because I'm not the one doing the work with the mice anymore. I'm just a cheerleader and, and sharing the, the amazing work they've been doing. So this is my lab. So we're an international lab, as you can see here at the bottom. And then if you have questions, feel free to reach me. I'm going to be happy to answer anything. Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, uh, both of you. Uh, what an amazing presentation. Uh, Dr. Menard, I'll start with you. When the uh, blood-brain barrier is pierced, is it always pierced from the external, uh, from the blood side to the brain, or can it be pierced from the brain side to the blood? That's an excellent question, which I call the chicken and egg, um, because what we've been doing is we collect the brain at one time point, so it's hard to know what's been going on, the different steps. So that's why I... I came to this place where I'm at right now because there's a lot of tools to look at the barrier at different time point and this will help us answer this question. Um, the other thing that's important is the blood brain barrier can repair itself really well. Um, so if you have no stress and then and an inflammation goes down, it will repair itself in a matter of hours, maximum a few days. But so what we think is happening is because the stress is chronic, it never stops, it keeps going, then there's no room for the blood brain barrier to repair. Great do question. Any, do you have any idea of what happens with like uh, an L, uh, IL-6 immune suppressant? Uh, does that uh, lead to repairing the uh, blood-brain barrier uh, if that if that is in fact a uh, antigen for crossing it? That's a great question. So we never look into that, but we have some ongoing project to try to understand how different treatment could uh, benefit to the buyer. But one of my colleagues, why we start this project is that basically she showed that if you the mice had no interleukin-6 at all, so they were transgenic to have no interleukin-6, it was promoting resilience. And so we think that it might be a mechanism. And yes, it will be very interesting to see if this type of treatment will protect the blood-brain bar in the context of stress, but not done so far. Dr. Green, outside of the blood-brain barrier, uh, can uh, reducing inflammation, even if it's uh, been existent for a long time, can reducing inflammation uh, help the body repair? Or is it, uh, is it a one and done where the inflammation has occurred, damage has occurred, and you can't necessarily just get it back? This is addressed to me, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, I think I think uh, Karen mentioned this, and I could probably say also from a neurobiological. It's what what's about stress is also true for inflammation. Not all is bad. I mean, I just want to let you know because without inflammation, without immune activation, the, we would all be dying of cancer at a very young age. Remember, our bodies have make all these mutating cells every day. Any one of them can become a dangerous cancer. It doesn't because the immune systems keep them, you know, identify them and kill them. So there is a lot of value to the, what the immune system does. I, I know there's a lot of bad, bad press for Im, immune systems these days, but I don't think that's 
it's a fair assessment. In fact, you know, my research is on aging brain. In fact, I, there's a lot of my research interfaces with Alzheimer's risk. And if the, in that, there are both strategies are good, meaning blocking inflammation actually may not help to remove amyloid or other this dementia substances from the brain. So I think, I think there's a lot to be said for it, but what I think would be helpful is to control what I presented in the last slide, what we call as this extra inflammatory sources, meaning, you know, some of that, and then also some of the chronic inflammation that happens. Again, you have to realize that the chronic, chronicity of the inflammation and the chronic low grade and persisting inflammation is the main reason. Uh, and in rheumatoid arthritis and in ankylosing spondylosis, the main concern has been that what we call as the chronic non-resolving inflammation, which is, you know, you have a, you have a problem, it doesn't go down. Normally the immune system is supposed to act and dial down, but it does not. It goes into this partially activated state. And so, yeah, so there is a lot of value to the immune system, both sides of the equation. And uh, this, so that is one of the reasons why people are cautious about, you know, applying. So applying immune treatments to everybody. Uh, Dr. Ramon, uh, you mentioned uh, T, uh, TMS. TMS. Yeah. What, what is that? Okay. Oh, sorry about that. I, this is a, <laughs> this is a jargon, professional jargon. TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Now, so, you know, the brain, the, one of the ways we have found that it's able to, the brain has many regions. It's a big organ. There's top, there's bottom. You know, by stimulating the cortical regions, we can control some of the emotional responses because the emotional regions, even though they are deeper in the brain, they are connected to the cortex. So what we do is we kind of, the, what they do is they kind of send, send, send in these magnetic resonance pulses. It's almost like similar to a scanner when you go for an MRI, but you get these magnetic pulses that are sent into the cortex. And then what happens is that in turn triggers a local reaction, which feeds back on the emotional systems. Now, interestingly, it's also being used for pain control these days. So there's also some research that this, by reducing the emotional reaction to pain, I told you some of the brain regions that were emotionally and pain sensitive regions. So there is a lot of research on that front. Um, and there's also some newer research that has come in recently. In fact, at our school, they are trying to do this uh, uh, ultrasound waves that can also go even deeper than the magnetic waves. So there's a lot of scope for this kind of brain focal brain stimulation research now. Uh, so uh, to either of you, can you talk a little bit about steroid injections and how they might uh, impact uh, brain inflammation? Uh, I, I, Caroline, do you want to? I mean, I can answer, but if you, Caroline, you you go. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> okay, so the steroid injections. You know, one of the things is there's been a long history of steroid being perceived as anti-inflammatory, right? This is a long story. It's been there forever. And uh, till, till, you know, Bob Adder and all these guys uh, in Rockefeller, they started looking at all of these things. Then they, they kind of, they realized that not all steroids are anti-inflammatory. But anyway, that said, to step back, um, the exogenous steroids are usually used as anti-inflammatory to control many different types of autoimmune processes, not just any one, many of them like MS, acute relapses, they use them. So this has been used. As far as your arthritis is concerned, I think the, the, the thing is they're only in, in, injecting it inside the joint that is inflamed. It's probably very effective for local inflammation, meaning if there is a targeted inflammation, of the giant cartilage, um, then it helps. The problem that I have seen many times is that there is also bone erosion sometimes with the, with the, with, the, with this immune autoimmune uh, destruction. At which case, I don't know how efficacious these measures are, uh, but I can understand that. I have, I mean, you know, people have gone through this. Many people need these, and some people respond very well. 
but some people don't have a great response to it. Now, systemic steroids, cortisone can cause depression and make it worse, but not the intraarticular or what we call as inside the joint implement in, in, injections. Uh, what happens when a person is uh, under such stress uh, that they can't control is uh, is uh, uh, systematic. It, uh, for instance, a marginalized population or people who may not have enough to eat or a, a place to sleep. That's a special kind of stress. And is there uh, are, are there any activities or thoughts that you would have about reducing it or at least reducing the uh, the outcome and in inflammation? Yeah, so I, I can I can take this one. So we do have some uh, project in partnership with um, First Nation of, of the North, First Nation in Canada, the Inuit. Um, so they are under a particular form of stress because of climate change there. For example, the territory is changing, like they, they live a lot. You mentioned food insecurity because um, fishing become different and there's a lot of, it's a very different form of stress. The other thing is they're very isolated. So it's very up north. So they're, even their genetic is, is very different. And, and so what we've been doing Doing is partnership which involve clinician, people on the field, people in the communities, and to try to tailor solution. And so with them, for example, there was a lot of uh, reappropriating their mm -hmm. own culture and then and re reappropriating like the, the youth to be more involved with the traditional way of doing different things, but also seeing mental health and health in general with the two white seeing. So how they see it with their background and, and their history and, and their heritage versus as us people of the South, we see it. So there's like very different different approach and ways of doing it. And I feel like the first most important thing is when you are stressed is first to acknowledge it um, and try to find around you if you have solution and resources that you can use. Um, and sometimes, you know, just sharing, it's it's just the first step that you need and never hesitate to to go see professional if if the stress goes way too far and, and you feel like you really need help. That That's the message I wanted to say. Can either of you talk about uh, arthritis medications and antidepressants and how uh, what the uh, uh, what the impact of one is on the other. Uh, I, I mean, I know that uh, Cymbalta is sometimes used as a pain reliever. Uh, uh, one of you uh, touched on gabapentin as a possible uh, inflammation reducer. Uh, What's the view of uh, biologic medications uh, and immunosuppressants and um, uh, depression medications in particular? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. So um, I think, so essentially, let me, let me, I think as to expand upon the slide, antidepressants have some kind of impact on chronic pain. Not a full impact, but somewhat. There is some impact on that. Um, same thing, anti-inflammatory agents do seem to have impact on depression, but not in everybody. Again, that is the uh, that is the lesson we learned from our study. We did a study on using infliximab, which is one of those chemical, uh, one of those uh, you one of those immunosuppressant agent. It blocks this uh, cytokine called tumor necrosis factor or TNF, and it blocks that. And it's been used in you know rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. It's, Kind of been used in all of these places. But again, in depressed patients with the high inflammation, we found that it improved, meaning these, these agents were useful. They were not useful in depressed patients without high inflammation. I mean, that's what I wanted to tell you, that in terms of depression and anti-inflammatory agents, we haven't seen any evidence that they are ideal for all subjects. Depression is a very widely prevalent disorder. As I told you, one in five people have it. So it's, a, it's very, very common. So I'm not and we haven't found evidence to say that it's useful for all patients. There is going to be a subgroup of patients with depression and high inflammation. And I think these people may be the ones who benefit from immunobiological agents. Uh, but I do want to kind of touch upon the minorities, the socially diverse I think there is there is a tremendous amount of, I mean, see, in our own sample, we had a lot of African-Americans because we are in Atlanta, where there is a lot of minorities in our systems. 
And our, our samples tend to show a lot more. The, so for some reason, the inflammation seems to have differential impact on different uh, ethnicity. I don't know why or how. And maybe there's more to be studied in it because there is a lot, there is a considerable amount of, I mean, there's a lot of difference in the way these racial uh, 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 racial responses to this medication. I mean, at a very biological level. Add to that the other kinds of stresses like social, you know, marginalization in social society and lack of income, then, you know, it just compounds itself with every other problem. Um, so I just wanted to let, know that there is a higher impact of, uh, of this inflammation, inflammatory depression among, you know, especially among African-Americans who are also having a lot of access issues. So just wanted to lay that out there. What's one of the best ways to find a therapist uh, if you are experiencing inflammation and, uh, and depression issues? Well, I think there, there, is, there, is, there is an extreme, I mean, there is no good way, frankly speaking. There is an acute shortage of all sorts of mental health uh, professionals um, in our society. Unfortunately, that has not been rewarded well. Many people have retired. Uh, it was not a very attractive career choice for doctors. So many people did not specialize in this. And many therapists are also in the private. The main issue has been that the insurance. So if you want to, if you don't want to find insurance, if you don't want to go through insurance, then there's more available because many of them are self-pay, meaning you pay them and then they provide you the service. Now, what kind of, uh, therapist should you look for? So I generally think that any kind of therapy would help as long as it, you know, any kind of therapy is going to involve some level of stress management, some level of cognitive behavioral, you know, techniques to hold your, you know, to control your runaway cognition where, you know, you get extremely worried and you can't stop, stop ruminating on your, on the, on the, on the bad things that can happen. So any kind of therapy no matter whichever way you look at it, it's going to have some level of anti-inflammatory effect. I, I think therapy is going to have some level of anti-inflammatory effect, primarily through stress reduction and other mechanisms. So I think that I don't recommend any specific therapy other than the fact that anybody who's available would be ideal. So can either of you talk about the uh, prevalence or the, uh, uh, the hormone uh, our body's hormones, stress, and inflammation. Uh, you can take that care, uh, Dr. Menard. Uh, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of interest more and more in research in general in sex differences, but also considering gender and other uh, diversity. Um, and, and so we know that the prevalence of depression, it's the same until puberty, and then it's gonna be higher in women, and then it's gonna go down at menopause. So we, we think that hormones are playing a role, um, but there's a lot of, of research on going on that. Um, there's a lot we don't know. Um, and I think that it's gonna be part of tailoring also the treatment eventually. Uh, for example, then the blood brain buyer, there is some receptor for hormones so I don't know if at different cycle like it could be in, in, in different phase of the cycle it could be different but this is something that we are currently studying there's been a lot of interest I have some students working on it and then so hopefully we're going to have some great answer in the future but if you have more to add Dr. Arun I'm going to leave it to you. Yeah, I, I agree with you I think that that's the future I mean so there is a lot of interest in hormonal dysregulation originally we were all interested in steroids and thyroid hormone that was the that was the yesterdays of this field. Now, there, uh, there is a tremendous amount of interest in sex steroids now because they, those are used in postpartum depression. Two new drugs, and there's one new drug that's being considered by FDA for approval. So I think that those are very important. And I think I agree with Dr. Menard that the entry of these medications into, because all these hormones get into the very easily get into the brain, unlike cytokines. Which find which need the special carriers that she showed in the pictures. So the hormones are a big focus of study going forward. Uh, I think we'll know more about them as we go along. Uh, one person asked that uh, they are uh, just now have arthritis. They feel great. Should they expect 
just as a natural process that over time they will uh, have mental health issues, become depressed? Again, predicting depression is a very difficult thing. I think I generally recommend maintaining health issues and uh, improving stress coping, stress resiliency things like yoga, meditation, physical exercise, uh, eating a healthy diet, those kind of things. You know, I don't think everybody with, uh, with, with the high inflammation are doomed to have depression. I think there is a level of individual factors, meaning many of the folks may have some kind of vulnerability to develop depression as well. So I do think that, uh, you know, if you're healthy and if you're doing well, please, by all means, maintain health. That is the main, main story here. But if you do feel depressed, you do need to get it treated one way or the other, especially I think by a combination. I don't, I don't think just the medications are going to help. I think there's going to be some therapy, some physical activity, some physical therapy, all of these things. Um, so I, that would be my take. I'll, I'll yield to Caroline if she, I mean, if she. No, I totally agree. I, I, I won't have anything to add. I think, I think it's, 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 it's also like it's not because you've been depressed once that you you're doomed to be depressed, and it's not also because in your family there is a lot of depression that you are doomed to be depressed as well. I think it's every every ex human experience is unique, um, but you have to be aware. I think this is the most important thing um, that you might have this thing, and and then if you start feeling unwell, then you need to take action right away and and not wait for too long. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Dr. Arun. I think the slide that she showed where you promote resilience is what I think is catching on in the field now uh, by, you know, developing these mechanisms of buffering against stress. It's almost like inoculation, meaning you take a vaccine, not to get COVID in the same way you do. Yeah, because we always say that it's not everybody who's stressed who become depressed. So what makes people protected or and then it someone could could have for the same experience become very very depressed but not the next time so what is different and again the human experience is very complex but we try to use our animals to just pinpoint what is the best i tell you physical exercise so far has been great so this is unpublished data it's confidential but um it seems to be protecting the blood brain bar very well especially against social stress and now we're f trying to figure if other type of stress could have a different impact um but yeah so so i I would say uh, pre not prevention, but promoting resilience and developing coping strategy. Again, challenging yourself and facing challenge. It's, it's a great way to uh, to be prepared when you're going to face adversity. I want to step away from uh, arthritis for just a second and talk a little bit about migraine. Uh, does inflammation, do we think that inflammation impacts migraines? You know, it's, it's a... Um, this is a fascinating question, and I have become more and more sensitive to it because I do have a lot of patients who have depression, migraine, and also have inflammatory bowel disease or one of those autoimmune you know, inflammatory disorders, uh, either bowel disease or RA, rheumatoid arthritis or SLE or Anki. So many of them seems to have you know, a combination of these things. I have come to believe that migraine may be one of those immunological disorders, although it's manifesting as headaches. Um, and I do think some types of migraine-like headaches, but not exactly migraine-like cluster headaches, are now believed to be completely immune. And there are immunological treatments that are also available for migraine these days. So I would probably recommend that uh, you know uh, you should talk to the uh, rheumatologists or your primary care doctors about the frequency of migraine and even get an appointment with the migraine headache specialist in your community. Dr. Menard, you mentioned uh, imaging as a way to uh, assess uh, depression and the uh, inflammation of the blood uh, blood brain barrier. Uh, are there other types of tests that a person with arthritis might ask their doctor about? So that's a great question. I will say right now it's still it's still preliminary. So I, I, there's a lot of other groups that have been looking into it and working on it. So I will not, and I, I'm not an MD, so I will not like give you a, an, an advice 
just go to your doctor and ask for it. Uh, but that's also why we're looking into what's going on in the blood. So if we could have an indirect measure of what's happening with the blood brain bar, because this would be more easily applicable to a large, uh, a lot of a lot of people because imaging, obviously, it's 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 expensive and and you need to image at the right time. And so maybe your blood brain bar is, is starting to repair. And then so we are still working on, on defining the, the right time window when to look as well as if we could have measure that could be done in the blood, but this will have to be validated by other groups and also on large, uh, large clinical studies. Um, I, there's been a lot of interest in the cytokines we've been mentioning um, and, and, and also in the treatment that uh, anti-arthritis, uh, anti-different uh, inflammation related drugs some of them use an arthritis have been tested in clinical studies. Uh, but I will not say to ask tomorrow for a test that I've been presenting. Yes. <laughs> have either of you observed any link between uh, metabolic stress and eating disorders? Oh, um, sure. I, I'll take this. So basically, you're talking about metabolic stress from eating disorders. I'm, I, I'm, I'm assuming that they, uh, uh, the question is about can metabolic stress lead to eating disorders or can eating disorders lead to metabolic stress? And yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, I'm assuming that, uh, you know, so the commonest eating disorders are the ones we refer to as, you know, binge eating. That's probably the commonest that we know of. Uh, it's widely prevalent and it's very common um, it's very common in depression, meaning many times when I see binge, binge eating disorders in my clinical practice, almost all of them are related to mood dysregulation, meaning when they're mood, they're more upset, they tend to eat more. And it may be a form of a coping mechanism with stress. Some people think it is a coping mechanism. So I do think that that in that case, there is a, there is a possibility of metabolic stress in the sense that they're going to be gaining weight. There's this metabolic inflammation is going to set in with those individuals. And so controlling the binge eating may be a good idea, but binge eating by its very nature is meant to be episodic eating. It's not a consistent daily thing, meaning it's supposed to be episodic and it's supposed to be present at the time when there is some stress or some big um, depression. The other type of thing is called where you have the restrictive or what we call as the the other type of, one of them is called bulimia, where they eat a lot and then they binge or then they purge or they do this dangerous thing that can lead to electrolyte depletion and can result in death. So that is one of those dangerous conditions. It's not actually binge eating, but it's just excessive eating followed by trying to get rid of it. I've had people who consume large amounts of thyroid, medic, you know, thyroid medications to lose weight. And so there are this one of those uh, behavioral things that will need to be treated if, and maybe life life threatening. The other one is anorexia nervosa, where they completely starve. They don't want to eat, and that's a that at that point they become they lose weight and they become cachectic, and they lose weight. And many times in those individuals, there is some evidence that there may be an elevation of cytokines. I'm not sure whether that is a consistent finding. Have either of you, uh, are either of you familiar with colchicine and uh, its impact on inflammation? Is it colchicine? Yeah. Oh, that, that is a, okay. That is a, a medication that's used for the treatment of gout. Right. Uh, so it is a, it's, pro, it's quite effective in several people. And it probably reduces, by reducing the overall gout-related inflammation, it may decrease. You see what I'm saying? When there is a right. gout, when, when active gout process happens, there is this tophite that gets formed because of the deposits of uric acid. And they are pretty, pro, they're, they're profoundly inflammatory, meaning they stimulate inflammation. So colchicine, I think, may be working through the uricosuria and by correcting the uric acid problem, but again, is it an anti-inflammatory? Uh, at this point, I don't know. I don't think so. But I think you never know with these things. The future research may come back and tell us that this is a very good, you know, anti-inflammatory agent. You know, so many of us have multiple diagnoses. We have uh, arthritis and diabetes. And uh, I, mean, I mean, the list just goes on and on. Uh, how do we find a doctor uh, or doctors or a doctor team that would be able to look at us 
uh, collectively as, as opposed to uh, sp sporadically. I, I guess that's the best. Any, any advice? Yeah, I, you know, personally, I think I just, going forward, the way things have gone on, we have all become so highly specialized. I mean, so much so that the, you know, like rheumatology, you know, there's a specialist who treats your arthritis. There's a specialist who treats the diabetes. I think under the circumstances, the best thing that I have recommended is if someone has multiple complex medical disorders, I would recommend getting treatment from the same system, at, you know, at the least. I don't know if there is going to be one person who could answer all the questions. Although primary cares may be able to do that kind of thing, although, you know, sometimes they don't. You see what I'm saying? I mean, potentially they should, but sometimes they kind of delegate or defer to the experts. Like I get deferred to, they, they would defer, you know, questions on depression to me. They would defer the questions on heart disease to the cardiologist. So it kind of goes. So my recommendation at this point is to, as far as possible, use an integrated system where you have all specialists under one roof, if possible. 99% of the time, that becomes a teaching institution like Emory or like UCLA, where I used to work, or Yale, where I trained in. So you, unfortunately, that becomes one of those uh, you know, difficult to, it's, I think going forward, it's going to be kind of difficult to, I think the, you see what I'm saying, if I may yeah. say so, very, to put it very crudely, the train may have left a station where you have one integrative doctor doing all of these things. Although I do have to say that the trend in medicine, medical healthcare delivery may be moving towards integration. Um, at least during Obamacare era, there was this whole pressure on integrating this. But now again, it's kind of splintered a little bit. So I have a feeling that the good news I, I do have to tell you is that now these advanced medical record, electronic medical record systems, so I can see what's happening with the patient, even if they go to another hospital. So there is some integration that is possible, but I agree, still is not, it leaves a lot to be desired. I wish there was a better system. So I have two final questions. The first is, uh, any thoughts on medical cannabis and CBD to reduce uh, depression and or inflammation? Dr. Menard, do you want to reference like this? Or you want I to mean, this is a complicated one. I, I know that there's a lot of, uh, of study going on. Um, I will not say it's a treatment for all. Uh, not everybody reacts the same way. Um, so here where I'm at in, in Canada and in Quebec, it's legal and then it's owned by the government that's providing the product. And then you can ask your favorite type and whatever buzz you want and all those things. Um, but also there's some high in CBD and almost no, no twist THC. So depending on what you prefer and what you're looking for, you can have um, what's a bit tailored for you. Um, I would say I would say to be careful because sometimes auto medication can be a good thing to some extent, but then at some point you can reach a level where you really need to seek help. Um, and and it's easy to think, oh, I'm I'm doing good on my own, so I'm fine. And um, so I would say I would say it's it can be a good thing, but you have to be careful about it. Uh, so I'd also like to add, and I, I agree with that. I mean, I do think that. Um, CPD is very popular now. Everybody is using it, no matter whether I whether I advise them against it or not. They're still using it anyway. So the issue right now is um, there is some some evidence that it alters some of the neural circuitry. There are some neuroimaging studies. There are some it alters the neuro. You know we know that. And some of the there's some you know one of uh, uh, Dr. Menard's colleagues, Matt uh, Evans, who used to work in one of these. Canadian universities, and he has done a lot of research, and it does modify the neurotransmitters. We know that. But the issue is, how therapeutic is that? Is a question that we have not answered as yet. Uh, so the CBD research in terms of depression, I think there is, at this point, it's very nascent. There are, we don't know. And the other problem <laughs> is CBD is also weak in terms of its you know, cannabinoid, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not actually like a THC, which is much more potent. So it's weaker in terms of it. So the doses that are used are very high. And so there is, there is not a very unclear evidence at this point so far, based on what we know. It, 
with regards to anxiety, it may do a little bit better with regards to anxiety because it does calm the nerves and does do better. I would still probably wait for the data to emerge, but at this point, I think as, you, as I, the cat's out of the bag, so I don't know if we're going to be out of, the genie's out of the bottle. I don't know if we are going to be able to put it back in. I live in a state which in Georgia, it's still considered to be a sin to have cannabis, but I don't think other states look at it that way. I kind of think sometimes a bit like alcohol, like alcohol, if you're like having social, like you're shy or it can help a little bit to have one drink and then you're more social, but then it can become a bad habit. And then it, it, it I mean, it can add. So it, you have to be careful. Like it's not a magic solution at all. Yeah. And then the uh, final question to both of you. Uh, how do you know uh, when you are uh, descending into a chronic depression uh, that you should uh, reach out and, and get help from somebody else? What are some of the factors that you would tell a patient or a colleague? Okay, I can answer that. So obviously, you know, the, the most common thing would be if there is any thoughts of death or suicide, that's well known to everybody. So that's public knowledge, but that's like, you know, uh, restating the well-known fact. But you're talking about initial, not the severe ones where right. there are suicidal. And I think, I think that is probably the biggest area that we are beginning to develop some knowledge on. Um, the main thing would be the main, main um, one of the commonest things that I see in my own clinical practice is an increase in, in sleeplessness. This has been a chronic problem. So if someone stops sleeping completely, then this becomes a problem. And if the sleeplessness persists for several days without a catch up, you see what I'm saying? Meaning like someone's not able to sleep for a week, mm -hmm. still not able to catch up. There's no catch up sleep. Then that's something that I would concern. I would be concerned about. I would also be concerned about uh, any kind of psychological symptoms of depression, feeling more hopeless, feeling more helpless or worthless what we call as the cognitive symptoms of depression, any of those things are, are easy targets for early intervention. Uh, low energy and fatigue is actually one of the extremely well-known symptoms of depression. In fact, it's one of the, and unfortunately in arthritis, it's going to be part of the story as well. You see what I'm saying? Because everybody's going to have arthritis. Well, with arthritis, everybody's, a lot of people are going to have fatigue. So it's very hard to differentiate it from immune disorders, depression. But nevertheless, if the fatigue increases, it's very likely that the depression is close behind. So I would recommend, you know, high levels of fatigue, low levels of energy and motivation, low interest in participation. These are what, what we call as anhedonic type of depression. Those are very common when the inflammatory states become, whenever the inflammatory patients become depressed. Dr. Menard, anything to add? Nothing to add. I think that was a perfect answer. <laughs> I will say for myself that I became angry. Uh, uh, oh, I mean, more than grouchy, I became angry. And it, it, it became a, a real issue. And uh, it was just clear that something more was happening. And uh, thank, thank God I was able to get help. Uh, just to just to uh, chime in on that, um, uh, you actually bring in a very nice point. Irritability is sometimes the manifestation of depression. You see what I'm saying? And easy, mm -hmm. easy, easily getting frustrated, easy, you know, short fuse uh, is a very one of the easiest, especially among males and in children, uh, because kids generally become very irritated. And so irritability is a very common and often missed symptom of depression. So we always tend to evaluate people when someone comes to us for irritability, we tend to assess them for depression. As I told you, there's also a lot of frustration with pain. 
Yeah, right. and that's what I was about to say. It's like uh, being angry and irritability. That's uh, one of the sex differences. Generally, it's going to be more observed in, in men, and so that's why we think that sometimes maybe the questionnaire uh, when you are like going for diagnosis are not maybe tailored for men as well as women. That there could be some refinement to do there. Um, and and this is another question we often have: is 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 there more diagnosis of depression in women because they seek help more, uh, and men just live or try to live through it until they go to the very end. Um, and so this is another of the big, why more women? Is it just because of the difference in seeking help? And this is why talking about it, it's very important because it's it's raising awareness. Yeah. And thank yeah. you for sharing. Thank you for sharing, Rick. Uh, yeah, it was, it was truly awful. It, it, it's truly awful if I don't take my medication. It, it just is. Uh, I want to thank both of you for what an outstanding, wonderful discussion we've had this evening. Uh, we've had a terrific participation uh, across our uh, channel, and you have both just done a terrific job. Uh, mental health and uh, pain and uh, depression are so, uh, so important in our communities. Uh, I, I do not know a chronic uh, a, a, a chronic disease that when you get people together, they always say the same thing. Um, uh, can we talk about mental health and the and the chronic disease? Uh, I, I have type one diabetes, and that is the thing we always talk about. So it's not it is not just arthritis. Thank you so very much. Uh, before we sign off tonight, just a reminder, we have several resources and events to help you manage your arthritis. First off, the California Coast Classic. Uh, it is a perfect way to uh, get moving and apply your new training. Uh, a signature Arthritis Foundation event, limited space remains for this year's tour. So if you're interested in taking the ride of a lifetime, visit arthritis.org slash California Coast Classic. Uh, I've spoken about this in a uh, uh, in a uh, webcast a few weeks ago, and uh, it must be outrageously cool. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, either this year or next, uh, take a look. Uh, Live yes Connect groups, the foundation uh, Live yes Connect groups are a great way to get support and learn more about positive coping strategies to manage arthritis. Groups meet in person or online. Visit connectgroups.arthritis.org for more information and how to join a community that understands you. Web, webinars. Every month, the foundation offers free webinars hosted by nationally recognized leaders in arthritis care. Next month, our webinar will be Arthritis and Body Managing Related Conditions. Uh, it will be June 21st from 6 to 7.15 uh, p.m. Learn about the most common health problems associated with having arthritis, how to manage, and even ways to prevent those from happening in the first place. You can learn much more about those events at arthritis.org backslash webinars. Walk to Cure. It's Walk to Cure season. Uh, we just had ours the other day, and uh, it's uh, you can help us raise funds for better treatment by forming by forming a team and fighting an event in your area. For uh, details, go to arthritis.org/wtca to register or find an event in your area. Podcast. A quick reminder: check out our LibYes podcast for even more tips and real talk about arthritis from experts and patients who understand it best. You can find that at arthritis.org backslash podcast. Also remember our helpline. The foundation's trained staff can help you navigate arthritis challenges from treatment questions to insurance questions and more. Visit arthritis.org helpline to learn more. And lastly, please note, that in a few days you'll receive a survey asking about your experience. Please take time to fill the survey out completely and honestly so the foundation can best serve you in the future. 
Uh, also remember, my name is Rick Phillips. And if you really like me, put that in the survey. If not, uh, then you don't have to. Thanks so much again for joining us tonight. Take care. It has been such a wonderful time being with each of you. And I hope that you have a tremendous week. Thank you.